can we give a very jazzy hand welcome to Rupert Reid. Thanks, that's a lovely introduction, Si. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in, uh, in Sheffield. Um, uh, it's such a healthy, big local group, that's great. I'm not 100% healthy myself, um, but I didn't want to let you all down, so I'm looking forward to this very much. So, let me start out by reminding you just very, very briefly uh, why we are here. And we're here because the situation is truly desperate. I don't know how many of you saw the latest thing in Nature, the world's most prominent uh, scientific journal, by basically the world's most prominent climate scientist this week, a commentary suggesting that there is evidence that, uh, that elements of irreversible uh, anthropogenic climate change may have uh, begun. Uh, there is evidence that the ice sheet melt uh, in the Antarctic and Greenland is irreversible. Uh, and that uh, these tipping points have now been triggered uh, and that the only question is uh, uh, how quickly or slowly um, we, uh, they will progress. So it's because of things like that, right, that we're here, that the situation is desperate. As I often say, um, if you're not uh, terrified, you're not paying attention. Uh, and that the situation is, uh, is, is full of sadness and full of grief and often we're full of rage. All of this, of course, comes really from love. We're here because we love each other and we love our children and we love this beautiful world. And we're absolutely determined to do what is necessary to take care of it, even though the situation is, as I say, potentially now one where there are limits as to, as to what we can actually do. We are committed to various kinds of terrible damage to the world and, and to our future. We are committed to that as a species um, by what we've already done, which just underscores the extent to which we have to be committed to doing everything that we have to be committed to doing everything we can to arrest that or at least slow it down. So it's in that context of, of awful uh, truth-telling which liberates us, yeah? Because once you realise that our, government has, our governments have put us on a track to this kind of catastrophic future, then, as we say in the Declaration of Rebellion, well, how can their laws mean anything much to us anymore? So we're, we're freed now to do what we need to do in response to that. It's in that context, it's in the context of telling the truth about that, that we find ourselves thinking, all right, so... What are we going to do? What is the best way to deal with this unthinkably horrendous situation? Which only, it's not obvious to everybody that it's like that, only because of the time lags that there are in the system. If everybody could see the ice sheet melt that we're already committed to, you know, could see the sea level rise that is already bound to happen, if that was already, you know, if, if, if there was some kind of machine that could take you into the future and, and, and show you that, like, like on a film. Yeah? This is what it will be like at minimum in terms of badness by, say, 2050, 2100. If everybody could see that, it would be easier for action, the right kind of action, to occur. But there are these big time lags, and the feedbacks and the tipping points happen slowly. So we have to act uh, ahead of that, and, and that's our challenge. We are uh, in the, the, the vanguard in that sense. And in that sense, of course, we're also in the vanguard in terms of the, the, the pain uh, of it. Uh, many of you, like me probably, um, have suffered um, excruciatingly sometimes, uh, mentally or in your dreams. Um, you know, many of us have suffered uh, from um, elements of, uh, of depression, despair, eco-anxiety, etc. We are, of course, the lucky ones. Yeah? We're the lucky ones because we're experiencing that now. Whereas for everybody else, as these things start to unfold, they're going to be hit by it more uh, later as it actually happens. They're not going to be prepared. We're going to be prepared. So we're, we're the lucky ones. So if you're, if you're suffering mentally from what's going on, you're one of the lucky ones. And we're also, we're also lucky because that suffering is itself part of our awakening, right? So it's rational 
to feel sad. It's rational to feel grief-stricken. It's rational to feel terrified. If you're not terrified, you're not paying attention. And, that, and those emotions can empower us to do the right thing, right? And that's, again, part of what Extinction Rebellion is, right? We feel these emotions, and spokespeople like me try to uh, express them as well. Uh, and then it empowers us to rise up and, and do the right thing. And that's what we are, and that's what we're doing. So the climate change debate last night on Channel 4, I imagine nearly everybody here saw it. If you didn't, you, you definitely must. First thing about that, remember, we achieved that, right? That almost certainly wouldn't have happened at all were it not for the huge change in the mood in this country due to Extinction Rebellion this year, plus, of course, the climate school strikers. So, you know, that's great. That's one among many examples of how things are completely different now from how they were uh, a year ago. And that's because of us. That's especially, I would suggest, because of April, because of the success of April, which I'll say more about in a moment. But in general, it's also due to the, the change in atmosphere that we've brought about. I thought the most powerful part of the whole program, actually, apart from the brilliant um, dripping ice sculptures, it was just, I, I just, I couldn't believe they had the chutzpah to actually do that. It's so, so good. It, 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 when I actually saw them, I thought, oh my God, they've actually done it. I just didn't believe they'd do it. I thought the most powerful part of the whole program was the little two-minute thing that uh, Channel 4 themselves put together at the start, that film, right? And I see, I've seen quite a few uh, heads nodding. Um, and that was powerful because it was triggering those kinds of emotions which I mentioned uh, a moment ago. And I felt that some of that was missing from the, the leaders' debate itself, right? They plunged straight into solutionizing. Uh, and there was very, very little room for any emotionality in their discourse or their way of handling the thing, which I thought was a little uh, disappointing. So we need to keep bringing that. Yeah. So as I say, there, that's a classic example, a, a wonderful contemporary example of how we've changed everything uh, this year. But as Sai has been implying, when we look at how things have gone for XR over this first year of our existence, I think there is a fairly clear distinction between April and October. And, and the distinction is roughly this. In October, we followed a, a strategy and it worked. Uh, and we changed opinion in this country. The opinion polls are very clear about that. And we got to meet with the government and, we got, and the parliament voted through a climate and environment emergency and so on and so forth. And we got somewhere, one first tentative step towards truth telling being instituted in this country. In October, we tried the same again, basically, uh, on a larger scale. And we didn't really get much more traction. Uh, and I think we have to be honest with ourselves uh, about this, um, that I think that when you compare April and October, it's a fairly clear contrast, really. April was a huge success. October was not. I'm not saying that October didn't achieve anything. October was heroic in all sorts of ways. October gave us some opportunity for some new great uh, media coverage and um, various good things happened. And we did some new things as well, and I'll talk about one or two of those things. But I think, to put not too fine a point on it, I think we can't really go on like this. I think the idea that we could just have another bigger gathering in the spring, which is the idea which a lot of people are operating according to, is not viable uh, for two reasons, really. Firstly, I think it won't be much bigger, I think is the honest truth. I think that we've, we've reached kind of the limits of this current organizing and momentum-driven model. And secondly, even if it was bigger, unless it was a lot, lot, lot bigger, I don't think it would really um, help very much. Uh, I think we've reached the limits of what we can achieve by just doing things like turning up in large numbers and blocking roads. Um, if there were hundreds of thousands of us willing to uh, potentially be arrested, if we could literally bring London to a halt completely, that would be different. And maybe we'll get there at some point. Because then we would be at the same kind of point that people reached in, say, the people power uh, revolution in the Philippines, when you literally can just say to the police, well, it's, it's obviously pointless for you to try to, to, uh, uh, to organize what we're 
doing because we are just incalculably larger than you are. But I think we're a long way from that point of having hundreds of thousands of people ready to take that kind of action. So I think we have to change up and be smarter. <clears throat> so let's take a moment to look at one or two of the things in the uh, October Rebellion which did seem relatively uh, successful. So one of them I would suggest was the um, occupation of uh, London City Airport. It wasn't completely successful. Um, it might have been more successful if there'd been more planning for it, if we hadn't been, I would argue, somewhat distracted by the thought of maybe targeting uh, Heathrow during previous months and the whole divisiveness around that and around the possible use of drones, which I think was not a very good idea because the great strength of XR comes from our vulnerability and our sacrifice, our willing to, willingness to put our bodies, our souls on the line. And once, you, once you use drones, you've kind, of, you've kind of distracted everybody from that and you've got these kind of metallic little technological devices which are associated in people's minds with unpleasant things and, and don't bring to mind simply ordinary people with their, with their bodies putting themselves on the line. But London City Airport was, within the confines of a relatively short time to organise it, I think a pretty successful um, uh, action. One reason it was successful, I would suggest, is that London City Airport is well known as an airport which is used disproportionately by business people and by people who are uh, from the wealthier end of the spectrum, as all airports are, but London City Airport more so. One reason for that is because London City Airport has a short runway, so the planes are all smaller, so they're all more polluting and, um, and there's a lot of private jets there and so forth. And then on the Monday of the second week, when we went to the City of London, that also seemed quite um, successful. Um, and that may have triggered the, uh, the change in police tactics uh, on the Tuesday when they decided to shut down the whole of XR, which gave us an enormous uh, boost because suddenly simply, be, simply wearing a badge like this, um, you know, I heard police uh, coming, to pe coming up to people in Trafalgar Square and saying, you're with XR, we'll arrest you if you stay here. Um, so assembly, simply assembling became um, allegedly uh, illegal. And that put a huge weight of public opinion onto our side. It was exactly the kind of overreaction from the authorities we'd been looking to uh, provoke. Um, and of course, the courts have since ruled uh, uh, in our favour and, and hundreds of rebels uh, are now um, getting their, uh, uh, their charges dropped because of, uh, because of that illegal, as it turns out, uh, police action of attempting to shut down XR uh, completely. Unfortunately, we then lost the momentum from that because of the uh, tube action going ahead on the Thursday uh, of that week. I would argue at, at the worst possible time because at a time when simply you know, being there with other people from XR and wearing a badge or something was illegal, it was unnecessary to sort of do the kind of anti-upping of a very severe nature that was involved in the tube action, um, uh, disrupting public transport and so on and so forth. So what lessons can we draw from this? Well, it seems to me that the lesson is a, is a, is a very, very straightforward one, really. Uh, and it's implicit in my uh, pamphlet, Truth and Its Consequences, which some of you will have read and uh, that I wrote this summer. And I think it's still um, uh, worth reading uh, as much now uh, as ever. And it's on that uh, pamphlet that I've built in the, um, in the uh, little document that uh, Sai has sent around uh, to you all that was proposed background reading for today. If you didn't get to read that, then Sai was Sai's gonna send it around again um, after today, and I would urge you to, to read it. I think you may find it useful. And the, at the heart of my argument uh, in that pamphlet and in that uh, document is that XR needs to shift from doing actions which are perceived as targeting ordinary people and the, the large bulk of the population to actions that are perceived much more as targeting those who are actually responsible for the problem, uh, the rich, the powerful, uh, the elites, uh, the large uh, corporations, um, the, the governors. Um, uh, and we've made the point completely that, yes, we're all in this together in some sense and that everybody is going to have to change. What we haven't done is made the point successfully that some are going to have to change a lot more than others uh, and that we do need a, a just transition and that in that just transition, ordinary working people are going to be uh, needing to change their lives a lot less uh, than the rich and wealthy and, and powerful. And that simple shift, I think, could give us enormous new power. And what are the implications of it? Well, the implications of it would be things like, let's do a lot more stuff in the city. 
and let's target London City Airport uh, again, or maybe uh, the private jets uh, spaces at, uh, uh, at airports and other airports that are up for um, uh, uh, expansion, um, but especially uh, those elements of them which are used by the, uh, by the rich and the polluter elite, such as, um, such as uh, private jets. Um, let's do a lot more of that kind of action. Let's definitely not do actions which target public transport. And by the way, of course, that really includes um, buses. So it means you have to be very careful about blocking roads. So why are we spending so much time blocking roads? Why aren't we doing more actions that target the polluter elite? Why aren't we doing more actions that target the, the corporations that um, in many ways control our lives and control the government? And I believe if we made this kind of shift, we could start to get into a situation where we have more public opinion coming behind us um, and do not experience the frustrations that I think we experienced um, in October. Now, some might respond to this by saying, yes, but we don't really need public opinion behind us, do we? We only need 3.5% um, of the population or something like that. Uh, so a couple of things about that, just briefly. I, I go into this more in the, in the document that, uh, that's been sent around to you. Uh, one point about that, which is quite crucial, is that this 3.5% figure, you need to be very, very careful with it. Um, don't confuse causation with correlation, right? What do I mean by that? So, yes, uh, Erica Chenoweth and others have uh, allegedly shown that successful uh, revolutionary uh, movements and nonviolent direct action movements succeed if they get about 3.5% of the population actively on their side. But they never aimed for that. Right? And we're aiming for it, and that could be problematic because they didn't aim for it. They aimed to be hugely, hugely popular, and they managed to get 3% or whatever of people onto their side. Yeah? But, but we're not aiming to be hugely popular. We're aiming to get 3.5%. But that's, very, that's potentially very dangerous because if we get 3.5% of people actively on our side and a vast majority who are actively opposed to us, I can promise you we're not going to win. Uh, we're certainly not going to succeed in bringing out system change, which is a more radical aim, by the way, which is part of what makes our task so challenging, a more radical aim than the aim that, than those in the Philippines or um, in the civil rights movement or the Indian independence movement. It's more radical than any movement has ever achieved. We're trying to do something which has never been done before, to achieve a kind of total system change, to make our lifestyles as a whole um, ecologically viable. Yeah? So... Very, very risky to think, oh, we only need a tiny percent and it doesn't matter if we alienate other people. That's not how people won in the past. That really isn't how they won. So we need to be thinking about doing actions which the broad ma majority of people think, oh, yeah, well, that makes some sense. I can vibe with that. You know, I'm not sure that I agree with their methods, um, but I can vibe with what they're trying to do and I can s I, their target makes sense to me which was the thing which was so completely absent at, uh, at Canning Town. It's very interesting to watch those videos of the confrontations between the people on the platform there and the, and the rebels there, and the people on the platform saying things like, um, but I agree with you, and uh, um, you know, I travel to work on the tube, and this is an electric uh, train. You know, well, what are you doing? Uh, and the rebels sort of sometimes going, hmm. <laughs> Look. Once again, to be absolutely clear, right, the people who, who did that were utterly 100% well-intentioned, of course, and you know, I know some of them personally, and I, and I love them, and they're, and they're brilliant. And we're, we're all just trying to do the right thing, and we're all learning as we go along here. Yeah? But I think we cannot go on like this. We cannot go on having um, small actions which bring the whole movement into a very negative light. Um, we cannot go on uh, having actions which are perceived um, as targeted against ordinary people. Um, and we cannot go on just trying to get large, larger and larger numbers um, to doing things like blocking roads. We have to get smarter in, in our targeting. That is the pitch I'm making to you here this morning. Now, how ought we to think about this? Does this mean that we are uh, moving to the left or something like that? Does this mean that we're becoming anti-capitalist or something as Sai uh, implied. Um, well, I don't think it does. And let me explain this. This is an absolutely crucial point. If we become identified as a sort of leftist uh, uh, ginger group, 
uh, or something like that. That would be absolutely fatal uh, to us. The thing about XR which is so distinctive is that we are broad-based. We are a response to the climate and ecological uh, emergency. We are an emergency response, right? It's an emergency response when you um, get terrified and decide to get together and do something about it. We're saying that the system has to change, not because of any particular ideology, right? but simply because it has to change, and it will change. Right? Everything is going to change. The only question is, will everything change because we do it intelligently and deliberately and quickly? Or will everything change because that change gets absolutely forced upon us by the brutality of an enraged nature collapsing our existing institutions and structures? <clears throat> The latter is far more probable as if you look at things objectively, but that's what we're trying to stop, right? So everything is going to change anyway, right? The question is, can we bring about that change intelligently? What's driving the whole thing here is necessity, yeah? not ideology. And that is how this idea of being beyond politics is still relevant. I actually think the beyond politics slogan is, is, is is not helpful. It's misleading to say that there's nothing political about what we do. But what's true about it is we're beyond party politics, um, and we're beyond divisive politics, and we're beyond division. We're trying to bring people together and say, look, we've got, we've got to come together to face this absolute emergency. And that we're beyond ideology. Right? So there, are, there have been people for years and years saying, um, look, capitalism is the problem. Uh, we need to challenge the corporations, we need to challenge the banks, we need to challenge the rich, we need to challenge the city. And they haven't really got very far, right? So I'm proposing that we do the same thing, but for different reasons, yeah? We could use the following idea. We need to, put, we need to, we need to create a kind of consensus, a broad-based consensus among the public that radical change is needed, and that change is necessarily going to lead to, for example, a future in which there are far less, probably none, <laughs> private jet flights. Yeah? Because it's just impossible to have private jets and to have a viable atmosphere and ecosystem. Yeah? There isn't the emission space left for it. Right? But because that argument comes from necessity, because it comes from just pure pragmatics, yeah? then you don't need to be a, a leftist or an anti-capitalist or anything like that to think of it. It's just, it's just common sense. It's just obvious. It's like food rationing in the Second World War, right? Did food rationing in the Second World War get brought in because we had a socialist government? No. It got brought in because it was an absolute necessity. It was a necessity for survival, because it was an emergency. Yeah? Food rationing made Britain a lot more equal as a society. It was, it was great for uh, the, the, the poor and the working class. It led to a lot more um, health, and it was, it was part of how Britain as a whole became incredibly more healthy and more equal during the, the Second World War. But none of that came from socialist ideology. It came from necessity. So we need to produce a consensus. But the way we do that is by working with people who believe in um, anti-capitalism, who believe in the left, etc. This is part of the so-called movement of movements approach but not for the same reason, not as XR, for the same reason that they do. So we could call it an overlapping consensus. So the consensus is on what we need to do, radical system change that needs to challenge the privileges, especially of, of the rich, and needs to challenge the transport methods, especially of the rich and so forth, yeah? But the consensus is on the basis not of our sharing, all sharing of the same ideology, because we don't, right? And that's part of why we say in XR you don't have to have any particular ideology to be part of XR, and you could be part of any um, political party within reason um, uh, with, within XR. So we've got Stanley Johnson, for example, saying that he supports uh, XR. There's a, let you into a little secret, there's apparently a conservative candidate uh, in, uh, in Wales who is, who is uh, of Somali origin, who's coming out and saying he's gonna support the uh, XR three demands bill uh, in parliament. You know, great. Hard to square with his party's manifesto, but great. Um, and so he can be part of the overlapping consensus too. Yeah? So this is again a fundamental aspect of the claim I want to make here this morning. That, that I put forward in my, um, 
in my pamphlet, Truth and Its Consequences, and in the recent document that just got sent around, um, an argument to the effect that we need to step away from doing things like uh, targeting um, thing, things that are perceived as targeting ordinary, ordinary people, for example, um, public transport. We need to step away from that and step towards deliberately targeting the, those, the polluter elite, targeting the rich, targeting the, targeting the powerful. That we ought to do that in a self-conscious and deliberate way. We ought to manifest that in our actions. We ought to be doing actions like, well, here in Sheffield, for example, you might imagine doing something like shutting down the, the HSB, HSBC uh, headquarters, something like that. I don't know, but that's one possibility that occurs to me as, a, as an outsider, um, rather than swarming in the, uh, in the streets. But that we do all of that not out of any ideological commitment. We are beyond ideology. We target the same people that, were, that have been targeted for years um, by anti-capitalist protesters and so on, but for a different set of reasons. So we achieve consensus uh, within the movement of movements and a broad consensus across the public, potentially, but that consensus is an overlapping one. You don't have to have the same underlying reasons for, for believing it. And for us as XR, this might not be your view as an individual, you know, you might be a, a card-carrying member of whatever, you know, um, the, the uh, Socialist Workers' Party, for that matter. Um, hope not, but anyway, you might be. Uh, um, whatever your personal reasons for doing it, the reason for doing it as XR is because it's essential, it's because it's necessary, it's because it's just, it's just sheer common sense in the face of an emergency, in the same way that food rationing was common sense in the Second World War. And also, and this is crucial too, if we do it as XR, we won't do it in the same way it's sometimes been done in the past by anti-capitalist protesters or by the black bloc. We won't do it through class hatred, right? We won't do it by saying, you capitalists, you're bad people, right? No, we'll do it without naming, shaming and blaming. We'll do it lovingly. We'll do it attempting to call those people in and say, look, we want you to be part of this consensus too. Become part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And you have children too, like we say to the, to the police as well. You have children too, right? We're all just human beings. Let's act like it, yeah? So the way we do it will be very, very different from the way it's been done uh, in the past. And that's, again, part of the essential thing I want to say, suggest to you here this morning. So I was delighted when I read the, the feedback from the Sheffield debrief to see that many of you have been thinking along similar lines and that your number one bolded uh, bullet point was apparently, yeah, let's do something which is targeted much more at finance, uh, at the rich, at the, at the corporate media, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm delighted to see you thinking that and you're not alone. Lots of rebels around the country are thinking in the same way. So one practical point I would say to you is, do make sure that you um, feed that back to uh, National, X, next, National XR, to the relevant national circles, also to the, to the region. Um, make sure that your voice gets listened to. And I think we can elaborate on that point by saying, I do think there's a danger that right now in XR, we've become a mass movement, but we're still not really acting like one. We're, we're still acting in a way which has um, possibly a, a little bit of a bias towards um, the positions of the co-founders and possibly a little bit of a metropolitan uh, bias. And uh, I'm hearing some chuckles around the room, which suggests that maybe that's, uh, that remark has resonated. Um, I wonder how many of you in the room are Game of Thrones fans. Have got any Game of Thrones, Thrones fans in the house? Yeah, we've got some, yeah, good. Um, I think it's first class um, um, political um, television and, and writing. Uh, no, really, I do. Um, lots of lessons to be learned from it. Um, you may be uh, aware, even if you're not um, Game of Thrones fans, of the, of the Stark family at the center of the Game of uh, Thrones, the Stark family who are based in the north. Um, and, uh, and they have this conflict with the, uh, with the, the metropolitan uh, figures in the, in the south of the country who've traditionally had the, had the power and the, and the whip hand. Um, and at one point, uh, a couple of series in, uh, the Stark family declare a sort of UDI and say, we're not going to try to assume right now the throne in, in the equivalent of London in the Game of Thrones world. Um, we're going to declare instead the Kingdom of the North. Uh, and they declare the, uh, the, the, um, the, the leading um, male Stark heir, the King of the North. Um, well, I'd like to, I'd like to see um, more sort of um, uh, self-belief and autonomous action from, uh, from XR in the North. I think that'd be a good thing. 
and, and I'm absolutely serious, serious here. Um, one reason for this is because the future is going to be more decentralized, and we have to start prefiguring that. It's going to, again, definitely be more decentralized, like it or not. Uh, decentralization, localization is coming either through our intelligent, deliberate, rapid action or through it being forced upon us by a collapse because when society collapses, it obviously relocalizes to a large extent. So that's one reason for, for that. But uh, another reason is simply that I think that um, we need to find ways of acting um, where we are to build the movement. Uh, and we need to acknowledge that there is, um, there, is, uh, uh, there is power and there is stuff that needs challenging um, not just uh, in London, but, uh, but everywhere. So, you know, uh, HSBC and um, your um, city region offices and a, a load of other things um, uh, in this area. I think that we have to build the movement until we maybe, well, until we either get our demands uh, accepted or until we become so huge that we can do what is imagined by those who, uh, who think of the 3.5% figure, which is that we simply overwhelm the authorities in the, in the capital city. But until we reach that point, and we are a long way from that point, we need to build a movement, we need to build popularity, we need to have targets that make sense to people, we need to not alienate people needlessly. Yeah? And let's act intelligently on the, on the ground here. So I'll finish off in a second, um, and we can discuss this. But I want to make one more suggestion uh, about the kinds of targets in that context that might make uh, sense. Um, as you'll have heard very clearly, uh, I believe that we uh, ought to be targeting what I call the power behind power. Um, so not just um, the uh, 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 government and local government, although they're important. And you know, I think you should consider um, um, uh, taking actions like we have uh, where I'm from in, uh, in Norwich, um, such as occupying uh, council chambers and stuff like that. Um, but the power behind the power, um, the, the wealth and the, the market power, etc., which drives um, a great deal of what happens in our world and which is incompatible with that world continuing much longer. And that we ought to do that as XR, not for reasons that are ideological or in any kind of capital P sense uh, political, but we ought to do it out of necessity. But that this will be most powerful if we do that in a way which um, makes sense to people because it connects with our vulnerabilities as human beings and our vulnerabilities at this time in history. What do I have in mind? Well, as you may have seen, for example, if you saw me on Question Time representing XR last month, um, I think it's, it's really, really crucial to get people to understand that this is not a crisis which is about 2050 or 2100. It's not just about rising sea levels, terrifying though, though that is. It's not about polar bears. It's not even about our children. It's about what's happening now and really soon um, because we are moving into unknown climatic and ecological territory right now in ways that are um, terrifying. Uh, and they're terrifying because of things like floods. They're terrifying because the, the floods and the wet conditions we've got at the moment due to climate chaos mean that Farmers are not able to plant winter wheat and that vegetables are rotting in the fields and so on and so forth. And this is terrifying because we live in a country which is unable to, uh, to feed itself um, at the best of times. And we think we can, we'll always be able to trade and buy food from the rest of the world, but we won't if the same thing starts happening in other parts of the world. So we are really quite vulnerable in a country like Britain. You know, we, we're accustomed to thinking of countries like um, uh, Bangladesh and the small island states and certain African and Middle Eastern countries is far more vulnerable than us. In a way, that's true. And those countries are feeling terrible impacts that we're not feeling right now. But do not assume that we're not going to feel somewhat similar impacts within 10 years or five years or a year. You know, for all we know, this current flooding and wet conditions is the start of a new normal. And Britain is going to have to get used to uh, a, a far more difficult situation food-wise and water-wise. Um, in the coming uh, years. We are not uh, invulnerable. In fact, we are becoming more and more vulnerable and exposed to harm. And what I would love us to do is to think about doing super intelligent actions that bring that, make that vividly present to, um, to ordinary people in this country. Because that's the way I think we make this more immediate and that's the way I think that we, that we win. And again, it's got nothing to do with ideology. Right? You, just, you just do things like you say, we're dependent upon this just-in-time system of supermarket delivery and world delivery of, of food and so on and so forth. This system is super vulnerable. This is, really doesn't make sense. 
uh, in the era that we are living in. We need to tackle the causes of dangerous climate change and we need to adapt to the situation that we're in by relocalizing our food, su food supply, drastically reducing uh, food waste, living lower on the food chain, etc. So what kind of actions could you take to draw attention to this? So you could do hardcore actions or fluffy actions, spiky actions or fluffy actions uh, at supermarket distribution centers, for example. Right? Imagine blocking a, 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 a supermarket distribution center and suddenly, within a day or two, Shelves in Tesco are, are clearing out because that's, this whole thing is this absolutely fragile, vulnerable, just-in-time system which makes us vulnerable, right? And that's targeting a large corporation <clears throat> in a way that draws attention to the way that we, as a population, are being made super vulnerable by avoidable actions from the powers that be, from the power uh, behind power. Um, and bringing that uh, home to people in a way that could make sense to people. So that's one example of the kind of thing I think we could do that would be, A, in a non-ideological way targeted against the, the, the right target, and B, done so in a way that feeds into a narrative that XR is going to be pushing more and more over the coming year of our vulnerability and our, to some extent, unnecessary vulnerability, to some extent, avoidable a vulnerability, a sense in which we're all in this together, a sense in which this is an immediate problem, not a problem about the distant future. Um, and something that if we were to, to apply pressure to, to show what would happen, right, if there were some real food crisis which may be coming uh, in this country, to kind of model that briefly, yeah. We could do that, we could do something in a way there that would be, that would make immense sense to people and would be like a sort of early warning system. Um, yeah, which maybe could make the difference in waking people up uh, in time. So I hope those, um, those thoughts are uh, conducive or at least interesting. Uh, let's have a discussion about them. Thank you once again so much for being here for this.